through a housing trust that involves intensification, well-planned, well-designed um, housing. So if you do buy from there, you sell back to the trust. So the only way that you can uh, the capital gain is based on inflation. You do not get the first buyer advantage of buying something, making a big capital gain, and then the, our future generations having to, to do that. So I think the council has to play a really, really important role if we're going to change the tone and the feel and of the city. In partnership with the private sector. In partnership with either with the private sector or some of the housing trusts, which is probably where um, a number of those uh, uh, initiatives need to be housed. Bill, you're on the board, I believe, of the Otatahi Community Housing Trust. Tell yes. me how it is that it, since you became councillor, the number of homeless families on our waiting list doubled. Uh, I am on the board of the Housing Trust and I enjoy it. It's the, one of the most exciting boards, oh, not part of the council, of course, Leanne, that, um, that I'm on. Um, we, we have 2,500 houses to look after. After the earthquake, 500 got lost. We're building them up. We're under pressure to put, um, to get our numbers up. I would, I would much rather see the old ones that we've got. We've got some that have been built in the 1930s. They didn't fall down in the earthquake because they were wooden and they just walked around. But they're not, they're not ideal. We are getting rid of a whole lot of our older uh, complexes, which might have 20 units in, and we're building 40 Homestar 7 units in there. And that is giving us more land it's a better and more, quality. more buildings. So we're going to be able to house those children? <sighs> if the, yeah. At the moment, there was, this is a number I heard the other day, is $1.1 million a month is getting sped, spent on motels. If we get those families into our houses, they will take the children with them, I'm sure. They won't leave them behind. All right, thank you. Um, we're just smack bang on time. So I'd like to now welcome our first guest to the stage, Tony Simons, Chairman of the Rickerson Bush Kilmarnock Residents Association, to ask his question. Welcome, Tony. Uh, gentlemen, um, on uh, Tuesday, the council voted to reject the government's compulsory intensification policies, which would have seen medium density housing across the entire city. That's created a, an impasse or a conflict between government and council. Can you tell us how you're going to resolve that conflict? And we'll hear from you first, Bill. Me. Um, thank you. I did vote for for that, and uh, we listened to the 17 um, residents groups that came along to us, and everyone was saying the same thing. It is an Auckland and a Wellington problem that has been thrust on Christchurch by Wellington. People move out to the suburbs to have a leafy suburb, to have um, a little bit of garden in the front, somewhere at the back that the kids can kick a ball around and stuff like that. That is going to get absolutely ruined. We are, have at the moment intensification... How, oh, sorry. How I'm going to repair the relationship? I will be jumping on a plane and going up to Wellington and knocking on as many doors as I can because it all comes down to the communication with people in Wellington that are making the choices. So, surprisingly enough, I actually supported the decision the council made um, on intensification because it was a plan that didn't make sense to the city in terms of scattergun uh, intensification across the city. Having made the decision, the hard work starts. Because the only way that we're going to get an impasse and make sure that things happen for the city that the city is controlling is getting the relationship with central government and local government working collectively to focus on how do we make this fit for Christchurch. And I think the door has been opened with the, um, some of the reactions of saying, we want to have the conversation with Christchurch but we don't understand you. And one of the things I know from bitter experience is Wellington has a very different view of Christchurch and Canterbury than we sometimes have of ourselves. And that's an important part of building the relationships and the bridges. We are going to have to take the first steps to help bridge that gap, but also with very much in mind a solution that's going to work for us. Thank you both. So we've got around nine minutes in this section to explore ways that if you become mayor, you'll work to improve Christchurch neighbourhoods. So whatever actually pans out after this week's decision and after repairing the relationship with central government, it's pretty clear that we'll need to live with and in a level of density higher than we're used to in Christchurch. 
I mean, it's happening already. I live in St Albans, it's happening already. Will your, what will your council do to make sure a more densely populated city remains livable? David, you're ready. Uh, so I, th I think an important part is um, why communities get really grumpy and really disengaged is generally because they don't feel as though they've been hurt or involved in the conversations. And I think we're needing to um, create a different engagement mechanism, not consultation, engagement about talking about what intensification looks like in terms of how we would do that in a planned way for a city. There are parts of the city that do make sense for intensification, clearly the inner city, but along public transport routes, some of the malls and other places like that, but they need to be really deliberately master planned, not driven by developers, Amen. but actually um, shaped in a way that actually makes sense with communities engaged in those um, conversations. Okay. So as you, as you plan those neighbourhoods with communities, what is it you're thinking will make this more populated, densely populated area livable? Oh look, there are really wonderful examples right throughout the world where intensification has been done really, really well. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that is in common with all of those is they have been done with communities and they have been deliberately designed and planned. It's, I think what often happens is we do it in a hodgepodge manner and that generally doesn't make sense for people. So planning itself is a solution. Phil, do you have a different answer? Yeah, we, intensification is quietly happening all over Christchurch as we speak. After the earthquake, I was under the impression that we were never going to build anything tall again. And all of a sudden we get this drop down on top of us. We do definitely need intensification by the major bus routes. Take, for example, um, Orange Series Stadium. That one day will not be there, and we can sell that land for social housing. Sure, and but people how can go, that, that will fill it up. And how's it going to be livable? How's it going to be livable? Yeah, Sorry? so you, you're living more closely with your neighbours. What can council do to make that neighbourhood more livable? Provi well, providing neighbourhood parks. One of the, and the other thing So neighbourhood parks. Yes, and one of yep. the other things we brought up the other day to make it livable is to have a 20% tree cover on all the new buildings that are built on, this, on each section. Okay, so what about the use of council's most... One of council's most significant assets, which is the roads and the streets in these neighbourhoods. Got any ideas for them, David? Oh, look, um, for intensification to work and for things to be livable, they need to make, again, make sense for communities easily used. Um, so when you de um, design intensification, those are the sort of amenities and connections to, um, to transport. And transport needs to not just be cars or cycleways or public transport or light rail or all of those. It needs to be a combination that is easy to use and well connected and integrated as opposed to a lot of stuff that is actually very, really siloed at the moment. Do you have anything to add, Phil? Transport, generally transport we're talking well, about Well, I'm, I'm still interested in a more livable neighbourhood. I mean, I, I think this might be key to making intensification work for Christchurch. Well, one of the things that came through loud and clear to me with the residence groups that came they are not happy with the three storeys high on three, three on three, I call it, right? There is nothing to stop a brand new section being built out in Horswell having three on three on it. That is not fair to anyone for the... Uh... So we know that. That's really well established. I'm going to ask you a different question um, to help sort of get us to understand this, like how to make an intense, a more intense neighbourhood, um, intensive neighbourhood livable. Do you think, and it's a yes, no question, do you think Christchurch should aim to be a city of 15 minute neighbourhoods? Phil? It's yes, no. Yes. yes. David? Yes. Okay. So you both said yes. So a 15 minute neighbourhood is a neighbourhood where households live within a 15 minute walk of core amenities like shops and doctor's surgeries and public parks. So they're a good idea. I have to say they're really from the work we've done. Um, do you know how to create them? <laughs> Sitting in one of my policies. Um, I should have, uh, should have remembered that one. But um, again, that comes down to, again, good urban design in terms of what is it required to enable a neighbourhood 
the, that all of the access to whether it be schooling, health, roading, um, you know, kind of shops or whatever, is within a 15 minute um, uh, radius and generally done either by walking or cycling within that. Yeah, so what kind of changes might we see in that neighbourhood if it's attractive to walk or cycle? Oh. I mean, Wellington just reduced 80% of their roads to a 30 kilometre an hour limit. Is that something that appeals to you? Um, I think that's an outcome. Jumping to that to force 15 minute city, or 15 minute uh, neighbourhoods, is not a great way of going about it. And so where Wellington, you know, again, if you, if you impose, say, 30 kilometres, when you haven't got the other processes working, it's a great recipe to annoy So everyone. somehow you've got to bring them all online together at once. Yep. Phil? I, I, have, I do not like the 30 kilometres. 30 kilometres out in the, sub, in the suburbs, I'm happy with, but 30 kilometres an hour everywhere like they're getting in Wellington, I don't think it's a good idea. So 30 kilometres an hour in our suburbs is feasible? With you as mayor. In, in, well, we're doing 40 at the moment in some of our and areas. some of them, mm -hmm. yeah, and 30 in others as well. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, so that that's is possible because it, it makes the street far more walkable for children. I mean, 30 is far less hurty. It, you're correct. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, but it depends how many people are living there. It depends if we go with this three-on-three three thing and fill it right up with people. Out in the suburbs, I don't... They, the people I talk to, they don't agree with it. I don't agree but with it. Near, the, near the, high, the busy route, yes, go for your life. So it could be Addington, St Albans, Linwood. <laughs> if you talk to some of the residents groups, they'd say no. But there are, there are some... Like, in the middle of town, fill it up within reason. But no, not, I meant the 30 kilometres an hour. I mean, well, the middle of town is 30 kilometres. No, I mean out in the suburbs where it's getting denser. No? Uh, yes, we, we've got Preston's, which is 30 and 40 kilometres an hour already. It's a brand new subdivision. Great. So it's good to know it's possible. Um, there are obvious differences between wealthier leafy suburbs and economically poor areas of Christchurch in their land use, their tree cover, the character and quality of their streets. What are you going to do to make our neighbourhoods more equitable? Phil? Plant more trees. <laughs> and now how one, are you going to do that? Now, one of the problems is we, we go around and we, we, we get, I get a lot of complaints about trees, damaging footpaths and roads. That's the biggest complaint that I ever get. And we say, right, we'll take it out and you plant two new ones. But the first thing that happens is, oh, you can't plant two new ones there because of the services under the ground. We've got to change things around. So we do plant them somehow in there and keep the suburbs leafy. But trees are like people. They grow old and they, it's time for them to, to die, sorry. Uh, and and, and they, they need to come out. They can't keep growing forever. Well, I mean, it is quite different in different parts of the city. I mean, Hornby only has 6.5% tree cover, whereas Kashmir has 21 and Fendleton has 19. Mm -hmm. So what's the secret to more tree cover in Hornby? I just plant more trees. And even, even some of but our... In, so street trees, public parks, but street trees and paying public developers. Parks, there are some public parks that could do with a lot more trees in it. We've got to get the canopy cover up. And planting little shrubs and things ain't going to do it. You've got to have the big stuff because that's, that's what makes the canopy number percentage change. Great. Thank you. Um, David, so how we, are you going to make our neighbourhoods more equitable? So we, we may more need, than tree cover? Yeah, we, we may need to think about um, different ways of looking at incentivising developers through development charges in, in, in terms of actually if you're building uh, seven-star um, environmentally friendly houses, for instance, you have um, a, a, a rebate on development charges. In terms of being able to make sure that the design um, that is sitting in there is actually incentivised with developers to do that, that actually is seen to add value to those um, uh, communities. The challenge with trees, yes, we do need to get the trees up, but we're not going to plant our way out of the crisis that we've got. Um, but what we do need to do is really de um, deliberately design um, houses. And I think we need to do that in combination with developers in terms of setting the right incentives to make sure the right um, housing stock is actually being built. Because the, the way that we're approaching it at the moment is not working, and we are seeing a greater level of inequity with tree cover happening as a result of that. Okay, great. Okay, so my last question in this section is, we're a coastal, low-lying city shaped around two rivers in a swamp. 
And, and look, we've seen some really significant levels of flooding last year and this year in the city. How do you think we should address the impact of flooding and coastal erosion for vulnerable areas? And I'm afraid you've got to answer this very quickly. Thank you, David. Um, I think that you know, one of the first bits is actually um, we've got to see it as real and uh, that it becomes a priority that there are going to be affected communities. And it's really easy to look at part, some communities and say it's their issue. I actually think it's a broader city, um, you know, a broader city issue. And that we are going to need to look at um, both adaptation, managed retreat um, as strategies. But if we're going to do that, we've got to do it with communities and a sense of actually communities being involved in helping plan and decide what makes sense or not. Uh, managed retreat is not the answer for everything. Adaptation is not the answer for everything, but there are combinations that are actually going to make the impact a wee bit less on some of those communities. Okay, thank you. Phil? We, you talk about coastal erosion. Um, we have had, we commissioned in 2018 a thing called the Niwa Sand Report, which shows that the beach is accreting in size. So at the moment, we're not getting coastal erosion. It's not to say it won't happen way in the future, but it's nowhere near as bad as what we've been told. We didn't let it out as the council. We should have been more transparent. It took 18 months, two years for it to get in the public. But it's, it's not as bad as what it is. Things like a, an isolated situation as Peter Tim's meets, which you will have all seen, where, where it uh, floods. The, the reason for that, that we didn't extend the Flockton Basin work all the way up to Edgware Road, which would have solved that problem. And it's going to cost $23 million to solve that particular problem, I understand. Uh, Are you? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So well, if if that's that what it costs, that's what it costs. Okay. We're, we're spending more than money than that in other areas, so Great. If that's what it costs. Thank you. So it's now, thank you so much for your answers. Um, it's now my pleasure to welcome Piper Pengali, student and youth leader, to ask you a question. Piper. Kia ora. My question is about young people. So young people are concerned about climate change, the cost of living crisis, and being valued by decision makers. How are you as mayor going to ensure that young people can be given a voice in council? David, can I ask you to answer that one? So I might um, answer that in a few uh, different ways, Piper. Um, one is actually taking climate change seriously, I think is the first bit, because one thing that has come through with every group of young people I've spoken to is a sense of uh, climate change being the biggest issue and challenge sitting there, and they do not think we're taking it seriously. So there's an element there of actually taking that seriously and um, with action. I think we also need to look at um, winning back confidence of the youth by being a conduit to their voice. Um, youth infrastructure in the city, um, we've also got to start imagining that it's actually more than just shopping and food. So how do we involve youth in uh, decisions and choices around that? I think the uh, two other bits there is actually getting education into, into high schools. And I have absolutely been persuaded to support the um, vote, um, Make It 16. Uh, vote. Um, I, was, I was kind of one of these older generations sitting there just saying, why can't we just get the 18 to 24 year olds to vote? And it was pretty clearly pointed out that actually it starts a wee bit earlier uh, than that. And I'd yeah, like yeah. to ask Phil to answer that question before we run out of time. Thank you. Well, what, one of the things I'm very lucky at council is I sit next to Councillor Anne Galloway. She is passionate about youth in Christchurch, and she said to me, please, if you're back here again, please continue the good work that I've, well, the good work that she's done, and I, I applaud her for, for, for the time and effort that she, that she has put into it. So we've we just got to work with our young people, get them in there. I, we went to a thing the other night, I didn't vote for the, or say that I'd vote for the under 16 thing, sorry, um, because it... Don't support 16-year-olds voting? Correct. Yeah. Correct. I, for, for one, there, there are a lot of people that are 16 that are very clever. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I don't want to put everyone in the same boat. But I believe at 16, I certainly didn't have any water under life water under my bridge. I didn't know whether I was coming or going. And I hadn't done any, any physical work and paid any tax to know how the system works. And I, I really, I strongly believe it should be 18 still. That's just my view. So one of the biggest challenges, I think, is actually um, we're making decisions for this next generation without the next generation sitting at the table. And we've, we've got to find a different way of dealing with that. Um, thank you both. Uh, I'd like to pick up on the climate change theme um, and ask a few questions around that. 
Uh, transport accounts for more than half of our city's emissions, um, and its fumes are blamed for the premature deaths of 300 people every year. Um, now, it's quite recently uh, the council released its unfinished draft 30-year transport plan, which shows how we could reduce our dependence on these cars um, by making bi biking and busing uh, and more active transport more attractive. Phil, I think you said this isn't what the people of Christchurch want. <laughs> Correct. What? Pardon? Oh, my mic's gone. What's your bold move to meet the council's goal of halving carbon emissions by the, 2030? The, one of the reasons I'll just one of the reasons I put the draft transport plan out with Aaron Kuhn is I just wanted people to see what was possibly coming up the pipe, so there was no surprises. With with um, carbon emissions, one one of the things that gladdens my heart is that ECAN have now bringing in two dollar bus fares for adults and uh, one dollar bus fares for people under 25. I reckon this is going to be the game changer in. Uh, February, and people will, if, if it gets, uh, from what I understand, if it gets 5% of people out of cars and into a bus, I would love to see a bus going past me in a car full, and if, if that does to help it. I think you've also said, though, that it's not, it's not just money, is it? It's um, convenience, and I think you've said that bus lanes add to congestion. So without bus lanes and buses are less reliable, do you think there's a conflict there in getting more people on the bus if they take too long to get to town? If, if, if you're sitting in a, in, a, in a traffic jam and a bus is past you with only a few people on it, that doesn't do you any good. Does with, that make you think I should have got on the bus? With lowering, with lowering, no, no, with lowering the price, the easiest way to someone's heart is through their pocket. If you lower the price of it, the travel and make it more regular, people will use it. Without it, the it, bus lanes? No, the bus lane, if the bus, buses are full and the bus lanes are working, right. it'll be good. Well, because there will be less people in sorry, the Sorry, I will give you a minute um, to answer, David, but I just want to, one last question. When was the last time you took a bus, Phil? A wee while ago. A wee while ago. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, David, what role do you see the council playing in reducing our emissions? Well, we, we, we've got to create an integrated transport plan that makes sense to people. It's actually safe. Um, convenient and reliable. And I don't agree that fees, uh, fares are the biggest driver for using um, alternative transport. What is that? For so many people it's safe, it's convenient and it's reliable. Um, and when you have to sit there waiting for a bus and it doesn't turn up, your likelihood of going back and using a bus drops dramatically. The same way as you're sitting in a you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, you've had a bad experience on a bike it takes a wee bit of time to get back on there. So that's part of the key. If we're really going to be serious about shifting people or changing the way that people access or get round a city, they have to be choices and that are simple to make. How do we make buses reliable? Uh, I think we've got to rethink the whole way that um, buses have been used. The, the, the crazy process that's gone over the last few decades with separating and breaking up buses and driving to the lowest common denominator um, and having all these private um, um, owners of so doing something, it just misses a whole bit of saying, so what's the strategy for the city? And we've got to think larger than just Christchurch, it has to link with the Selwyn and Waimakariri because they are communities that are accessing and using um, the city. And, and one of the things that we are, sorry, one of the things we are struggling with is getting bus drivers and retaining them because they, sadly they don't get paid enough. But actually, it's some interesting stuff like down in Timaru at the moment, the you know, kind of on-demand type elements. I'm not so sure that's a solution for Christchurch, but actually the thinking that's gone into that should be where we are you know, kind of challenging our way in terms of what does and what do some uh, future alternatives look like. Can I ask you... Because what we can't do is keep preaching at people and telling them they need to do, they need to use the bus, they need to go on a cycle, because that's not working. <laughs> Do you see cycling as one solution to our transport problems? Yes, cycling is, um, cycling is one part of it. And it's, it was fascinating, an article in Stuff um, a few days ago of pictures of Christchurch that actually used to be a cycle city. It was stunning when you looked at it in terms of there were no cars there and actually that was our norm. And we've gone from one extreme to the other. And somewhere along the way, we're having to find a happy medium um, that element, and you hear so many parents describing, they, they do not feel confident for their kids to cycle to school because it doesn't feel safe. And that's the bit we've got to solve. Because if we can unlock that, it is more likely that people will start making different choices.
Bill, how do we make cycling safe? We, I, I have no trouble with cycle lanes. Everyone's saying, oh, you're anti cycle you're anti I've got no trouble with cycle lanes. I'm, I do have trouble with sometimes the width that, and people say, oh, they're over-designed. They're not. They're just, some of the ways we're building them are, are, are costing too much. The one cycleway that I really want to push in Christchurch going forward is the one that goes from the city to the sea along the Otafra River Corridor, because that's more like, a, going to be more like a, um, mobile nature trip for a, to take a family on. You can feed ducks, you can try and do fishing, you do all sorts of things, and that'll be good for a family out there. Um, you know, fair enough, we build, we build cycleways on the road, but Joe Average commuter cyclist normally uses what, the what's road. What's the hold-up that's been, uh, that green spine and cycleway has been in the planning for a long time? What's, what's the hold-up? Uh, no, 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 money's not a hold up. We've been given $40 million towards that. Um, we have started down at the, the Brighton Bridge end. The, the, the um, stock bank has been moved back, and what glads my heart is we're going to move the stock banks back. Instead of them being this high by the river, they will only be that high 100 metres away, and that's going to make it re really, really good. So it's logistics. Is it? It, it is Mostly. logistics, it All is right. money. There is, okay. there is some plans, there, there's a lot of plans being done by the Reserves Department on the area by Kerr's Reach, okay. and I'm looking really forward to that, that coming through. So it's, it's a nice segue, actually, um, because I wanted to ask you a little bit about the Red Zone and perhaps our relationship um, with Mana Whenua. Uh, on Monday, we published a story saying that Nai Tua Hereri has criticised the council for making little progress towards a good Te Tiriti relationship with mana whenua. So Tamari Tau has called for a fundamental shift in engagement. Um, David, how do we achieve that? Well, um, I agree that relationships need to improve because they've certainly been uh, very much stressed or, or stretched with a number of changes that have been going on. And we need to move from a not just um, interrelating with Naitahu after the fact. They need to be engaged right at the beginning with an engagement right up front. And if we're really going to be true to the city, it needs to be a genuine partnership. And too often, it is an afterthought or we need to go through then a almost a tick box to say that we've had the engagement or the consultation with Māori. That's not good enough. And I look at the red zone, and um, I, I come back to the, you know, kind of the council declaring a climate emergency in 2019. Um, if this is an emergency, we're not moving particularly quickly, and a core component of that is actually what we do with the Otakaro Red Zone. It has a detailed plan, and heaven knows why it's not happening no, faster. And I, maybe Phil, and maybe is it something to do with our relationship with Nai Tua um, Just um, about, excuse me a minute. Two or three months ago, we started up a co-governance group with um, Nai Tahu, and that is, that is the way forward. Um, Tamaro's on it. Nook Karako's on it. I, sorry, I can't remember some of the others, but I, I know those, those people are on it. But talking about the relationship with Tahu, sorry. One of the things I did the other day, I voted to leave C4. That C4LD had done their job. We, we, we'd joined their group. We'd given them the money. They really pushed their barrow, and they did a fantastic job. But it was time for to repair, repair and so it's it come time to, for us to repair and re resuscitate or our our relationship with um, Naitahu. And that, that's very important to me because going forward, there's some very important things coming for Christchurch that we need to have them in the same tent pulling in the same direction. Yes, I have my very good friend. I'm, not, I'm very bad at it. Uh, my very good friend um, James Daniels is teaching me. I'm, I, I go home and I practice, and my eight-year-old granddaughter tells me I'm not saying it right. That's it's, but I, I am trying. It's, okay. uh, it's yes. Good to hear. David, um, I have uh, two children that I have, um, oh. and they are certainly guiding me on a lot of 
my approach. That, that's to that. wonderful to hear. Um, thank you both. Thank you for those answers. Now I'd like to invite our third guest onto stage to ask a question. Jeanette Ward is a transport engineer and technical director at Transport Planning Consultancy, ABLE. Kira. Transport has an impact on the livability of our cities. We've already heard a lot about that tonight. My question for you is, what is one of the key things you would do with respect to transport to make Christchurch a more livable city? One. One. <laughs> <laughs> One. Um, to, for transport, uh, to make Christchurch more livable is to make... Uh, hello? Got it? Sorry. We've, we've got to make our, our public transport more accessible. And as I said, this, this $2 bus thing that the ECAN have bought out and the $1 for under 25 is, is going to be the cha game changer because we've got to get more people in the city to make the city better, but we've also got to let them get in here cheaply so that they can, so, so they can enjoy it. Not everyone is going to live in the city and we've got to make it so that people can get in. Part of the challenge is actually planning that makes And I'm not sure whether it's just something not planning the or um, involve them in actually what a livable city looks like relative to transport. There are a lot of solutions that have come up and a lot of solutions being imposed on communities. But the one thing is I think that is really missing is the narrative about so how does this support a livable city? Because for me, that's the part that's missing. And I sit there and sometimes I can't understand. And I look at all the um, you know, entertainment events that are being created in the centre of the city, like the stadium and other bits. And you look at that and say, how is this all going to work for me as a member of a community to make sense, to get into a city, to enjoy it, and to get back to home? And at the moment, the solutions that I've seen don't make sense for me. So, uh, thank you, Jeanette. So, we'll go to the big picture now, and I'd like to ask both of you, what's your idea for how Greater Christchurch can accommodate one million people in the future? So you're going to have to project a really long way into the future. How will we live, and how will we get around this greater city? David. But, um, have that, that's, that's an we, um, this is why intensification and plant intensification becomes really, really important because we are going to grow um, just even in Christchurch a population by you know, another 30 to 50,000 and if we don't plan for that it's going to be a shambles. The great Christchurch component, I think increasingly it is a broader community that are all accessing and using very common and similar um, similar parts of the um, of the region and the city. Um, we've got to make sure that we're planning in um, transport corridors like light rail. It just does not preclude that from becoming an option into the future. And I'd hate to see us getting to an Auckland where somewhere in the future that we're retrofitting stuff back into the city that actually hasn't been planned. And so me, for me, that's where the council has to play a really critical role in getting the long planning right. It's not about making it come to life today, but we do need to make sure that future generations have choices for themselves. <coughs> Light rail is getting mentioned a lot at the moment. Um, I think it's sad that at least, at the, at the worst, there wasn't um, some land left in the northern cor corridor and the southern corridor for that to be done one day. But I don't think we're ready. If we've got the land for it, that's cool. But I don't think we're ready for it yet. If the buses were chocker and, and we put plenty more on because of the demand, then you could say, right, let's start building it. But I think if we started building it, not now, but it would be, it would be not used. It'd be just like the, uh, we've got to change the way people think. And get it, making it cheap in buses, getting them used to going on buses, that's how it'll lead into light rail rapid transit that you'll advocate for at the Whakawhanaike uh, Kaina Committee, if you're there, as will be a rapid bus transit. For a start, you've got to start somewhere. You, if, you build, if you build the big Rolls Royce thing and no one uses it, you've spent a lot of money and done it and wasted it. If get the buses, get them chocker and get them coming in. 
do we have time to wait for that? It takes a good 30 years to plan for that kind of rail corridor, doesn't it, David? Infrastructure in this country takes, I was about to say a lifetime, but it is almost, it is almost that. And, and I think it is when we look at, um, and I'm just reflecting on the uh, business case for building Christchurch Hospital, it had a really obvious case there and, and 10 years later, it's still got big elements for it to be completed. And so th we've got to find a way of speeding up some of that. But yes, it is a long, long time. Thank you. I'm going to ask you a completely different question. What's your favourite public space in the city? You've got the mic, Phil. Mm. Probably Cranmer Square. Well, it's just, I, w I actually walked across it the other day, and, it, and it's beautiful. The grass has all been redone. It's, it's absolutely, it's, it's just nice and tranquil, and it's, it's got a lot of thoughts. That's where, uh, Cramer Square, is where all the, um, the soldiers from World War One left there to walk down to the, march down to the railway station to go on the um, train to Littleton, and some of them never came back. So it's, it's quite a special place to me, I feel. And it's also a wonderful public place in one of the more denser parts of the inner city. David, where's your favourite public space? I, I guess I've got two. I'm going to be a bit mm. greedy. OK, if you're quick. Uh, one, one is the Port Hills. I just absolutely love that in the backyard and being able to get up there um, where the walking or cycling. Yep. And the other is actually the area in the south part of um, Christchurch where the welder is. And it's just some seriously cool start-ups, innovation, um, a whole lot of stuff that I never actually knew existed in the city. Great, thank you. A completely different question. Yes, another one. Um, well, we started 10 minutes later, so we're going to run 10 minutes over. Um, some people vote, engage with, and submit to council. But for one reason or another, the majority don't. I mean, I don't understand it, but um, how will you represent Christchurch people who aren't currently voting? engaging and submitting? Well, I, I think it, it comes down, the, the submitting side of it, I think it comes down to trust. People, we, we design something and we put it out there and sometimes we just give, we, it sort of comes across as, here it is, tell us what you think. If you're not happy, please submit, and some people do. But we don't make it that easy. A lot of people, in my view, don't submit because they think, oh, Council's made up their mind, why should I bother? Now, one of the things that I liked about what we did with the stadium is we put it online so people could go, yes, no, yes, no, and it was simple. I think we should use that system more often for submitting. Council always has online submission. That's not new. No, no, no. With the, with the stadium, it was, it was, what do you want, yes or no, and it was very simple. Not, not miles and miles of writing, because people have to download the piece of paper and fill it up and and send it in, and then be asked if they want to speak. Now, a lot of people don't like speaking in public, me being the only one. <laughs> no, you're doing great. David, do you have a different answer to that one? Um, yeah, look, I think we need to reactivate community boards, and they, in fact, might be the communication arm, or you know, kind of the vehicle, I suppose, uh, for, again, the reconnecting and the communication and the linkages back there. And I think we need to start being brave about exploring some alternative forms of democracy, like participatory budgeting actually engaging, re-engaging communities, they know what's important for them, for them to make decisions around that, and for them to um, oversee and determine what is going to be spent in those areas. Those sort of things are, are, are new trends that are emerging, coming from the basis that actually communities have got themselves so disengaged, they don't feel they've been heard, and they don't feel as if they've got a voice, and we need to change the framework of that. In consultation online, there is so much of our community that does not reach and reflect. And sometimes we can get quite distorted views about what we think is happening in a city. And we've got to change um, some of the engagements with that. And unfortunately, that starts with neighbourhoods and it starts with communities. I, 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 I do disagree a little bit. Like the community board that I was on in Coastal Burwood ran like a swish watch. We really got things done. We mowed through the work. And it was an absolute pleasure to be involved with those guys over there. Great. Thank you. So Christchurch has been known worldwide as a creative place, especially in the past 11 years. So how do you make sure arts and the creative community thrive? Well, I'm going to challenge your question. Oh. Because 
with all of the conversations I've had is in, in, um, in Christchurch, we seem to be able to describe Auckland, we seem to describe Wellington and Queenstown, and we describe what Christchurch was, but we're struggling to describe what it is today. And I don't think we've actually got our narrative or our story right, and this includes the arts and the innovation and a whole range of other things that sit in the city that are just world leading edge, and it's not part of our story. And if we're really going to be serious about the arts, we've actually got to lift its profile. But that, again, is just one part of what we need to do for the city. OK, great. Thank you. Phil? We're, we're, we're doing a lot, a lot for the arts. One, one thing I'm so thankful for is uh, after the first earthquake, the arts centre found that they weren't covered enough and they upped their um, cover by quite a lot. The second earthquake came and that's what got the thing rebuilt. We, we are so lucky that that happened. The other thing that's happening, we're getting the um, court theatre back into town. We've got the whole arts precinct. Now, to be fair, <laughs> to be fair I, was, I was one of the guys that said, oh, that car park that was between the court theatre and the theatre royal, I was happy to sell it. But then, sorry. No, no, no. It's great. You keep going. <laughs> yeah, I, I, w I was more than happy to sell it. And then it was bought to me and said, because we weren't told at the time, there was another car park being proposed next door, just next block over. Yeah, so I was more than happy to rescind that thing, which didn't go down with a lot of people, uh, sorry, the, the, the developer. But it is more important that the arts centre, uh, the arts precinct, stays there for arts. Now, if that car park area just ends up as a paved area for jugglers to go on it or fire eaters or something like they've got it the, um, along the river at Sydney or Melbourne, where I frequent when I go over there, that, that's what it's all about. It's for arts. So we could expect to see a pop-up arts venue in that space in the future, if you're mayor. Well, it's got to be something to do with arts. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. It won't be a car park, put it that way. <laughs> thank you. So, um, thank you both. Look, it's Friday night, it's just gone 6.30, and I know you'll be both happy to hear that this is our final question this evening. Please answer as succinctly as you can. What will your legacy be? How will Christchurch be a better city after your meal to? Phil's got the mic. I want, going forward, after my mayoral tea, which we're not sure how long, even if it'll start, but <laughs> when it gets to the end, I want people to look at me and go, Phil made Christchurch the best place to live, work, invest and play in the country. Now, what we have got is we've got... Yes, here we go. <laughs> we, we've got all these new amenities. We've got the stadium coming, we've got Metro Sports coming, we've got Tapai, which is working really, really well. Um, We've got Margaret Mayhew Playground, got the town hall. We've got all of these things. We're well, not nine Poonawai out there with hockey surfaces and running. We are that far off getting the Commonwealth Games here this in the next, I don't know, two, two cycles because when I lived in Brighton, right across the road from QE2 at the 10th Commonwealth Games, they were the friendly games and it was a fantastic time. Sometimes with Commonwealth Games, it breaks a city because they just can't afford it. We've got all this stuff. We, we, we don't need it. it, we might as well use it. And if it brings people to town and gets the city humming, it, it'll be, that's what I would like to see one day, that that's what happens. OK, so we'll be a better city because we host the Commonwealth Games. David, what do you have to say? I think <coughs> looking forward to a, a confident, forward-focused um, city that's actually got its own narrative, that we can actually tell our own story to ourselves and tell it to others. Also recognised as a climate leader, and we're attracting innovators. And building off our greatest strengths in this community, that's our people. And we are vibrant, innovative and creative. And we just need a council that's actually going to enable that to flourish. Great. Thank you both. Look, we want to thank you both so much for being here this evening. And thank you for putting up with the technical difficulties. You've handled it like pros. Um, and thank you for answering our questions, especially those of our guests. And thank you to all of you who have joined us here online and in the room uh, here at Turanga. Te Putahi and the press would very much like to thank the sponsors who have made this evening possible. The major sponsor, JLL, alongside the Urban Design Forum and Te Kahu Whaihanga New Zealand Institute of Architects Canterbury branch. 
We also acknowledge the work of our teams behind the scenes, pulling things together, Bonnie, Richard, Andre, Alex, Gabby, Zach, Emma and Louise. And I think we really have to end by encouraging each other and our neighbours, our friends and family to vote. And when we vote, let's have in mind that incredibly wise Naita Fokotoki, Motato, a mo kauri, a muri akine, for us and our children after us. Thanks, everyone. Now, now, if you're in the room, um, despite the fact that we've run over, the candidates have agreed that if you want to have a chat, they'll be over here for a few minutes. So if you want to talk to them and follow up on any questions of your own or some of the things discussed tonight, they'll be here for a couple of minutes. So you can grab them. Thank you.